Spirit of living God, we come before you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, again, that you are faithful and that you are faithful to yourself. And your faithfulness brings us along when we're unfaithful. Lord, we we thank you for your word. And as we get into your word, Lord, of course, we ask for conviction, challenge, and change. We ask that our hearts are open to receive what you have, that we may grow deeper and closer to you. Mm-hmm. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we are in Second Kings, verse 24 through chapter 7, verse 20. Um, if you guys remember last week, King Benadad of the Syrians had sent out, uh, bands of raiding parties to, you know, pillage and plunder throughout Israel. And every time he wanted to kill the king, Elisha would tell the king of Israel where not to go. And so Benadad thought he had a traitor amongst his people and wanted to get Elisha. And when he sent his, his army down to Elisha's uh, city where he was staying, Elisha played, prayed that the Lord would blind them. They were blinded, and Elisha walked them back to the capital city of Samaria. And the Syrian army thought they were doomed, but instead they were blessed with mercy and, and got a feast and sent home. And so in Benadad's military, in his army, in his people around the nation, his people are starting to get saved. First, he sent his number one general down and he got healed of his leprosy. And he came back and said, I'm worshiping nobody but the God of Israel. All the people who were with him saw it happen and now they are following God, and that made Benadad mad, so he wanted to get rid of Elijah, and then these dudes came back and were like, their God is real. You guys caught up? So you would think at this time, Benadad would be like, you know what? Maybe we should just leave Israel and their God alone. But we pick up in verse 24, chapter 6. And it happened after this, that's after his army that was blinded came back and said they were never going back to raid Israel again. Benadad, king of Syria, gathered all his army and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And indeed, they besieged it until a donkey's head was sold for 80 shekels of silver and one fourth cob of dove droppings for five she- five shekels of silver. Okay, so Benadad, instead of rejoicing in the Lord for bringing salvation amongst his troops, he flew into a rage. He decided an all-out war was needed to get rid of this horrifying threat from the God of Israel that was saving his people. Now, what's interesting is how people want to get rid of God by destroying his human representatives. In this case, we, we, we see Jeroham uh, and the people of Israel who represent God because they're God's chosen people. Now, in spite of that, most of the people in the northern uh, kingdom of Israel were idol worshipers. But as a nation, they were still Jews. They were still God's chosen people. And they still represented the Lord to the rest of the world. And God was still working through them. Now, if we take a step back and just look at the world, the two most hated groups on the planet are Christians and Jews. As Christians, the world wants to get rid of us because we are the bride of Christ and we represent Jesus to the world. But the world also wants to get rid of Israel because Israel 
is still God's chosen nation. Now, check this out. Pretty soon, and, and, and I believe coming through and beginning on what we call the left, the political left, you're going to hear people openly saying that Hitler was right. Now, you're just like, oh, no, that couldn't possibly be. But we got people right now arguing that a man is a woman. So, I mean, really, just think about it. But as much as the world hates Israel, because of the church, they cannot get to the Jews. Because the church is still on earth, the world can't have its way. Right? When you look at the world, and you can think about it, it's the, it could be the alphabet community. It could be atheists. It could be Muslims, Mormons, Buddhists, Hindus, whatever. They're all united in wanting to remove the Bible and wanting to get rid of Christians. And they all despise Israel. And you wonder, like, well, how can all of these groups who don't agree with each other stand together? Because it's the spirit of Antichrist. Now, when you think about Antichrist, Antichrist doesn't just simply mean against Christ. It also means with a greater, broader meaning instead of Christ. So anything you put up besides Christ or instead of Christ is Antichrist. So when you look at all of these groups, they have something instead of Christ. You understand what I'm saying? So... Whatever people put their hope in, it's worship. And that worship is Antichrist. So everybody who rejects Jesus as God, they reject the Bible. And they reject Bible-believing Christians. And they reject Jews. So for Benedict, um, basically, he just couldn't take it anymore. You know, when you resist the Holy Spirit, the result is always violence. As God begins to move on you and to draw you and to call you and you dig your heels in, violence is always the result, either to somebody else or to yourself. Because it's just the way it goes. If you resist God, only thing that's left is the way of the devil. So for Benedict at this time, He needed to get rid of the Holy Spirit working through his own nation. So he sought out to destroy Israel. And at this time, remember what's going on. Do you guys remember what's going on right now? There's a famine going on and the nation is already weakened. So this was the best time for him to attack the city. So they sieged the city. Now, I mean, everybody's like seeing, um, I don't know, what do you call that, that, that show with the dragons, that movie, and the little elf people, Game of Thrones, okay, that's kind of like one, not Game of Thrones, but the, the one uh, with the hobbits, Lord of the Rings, Rings. right, 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 okay, you know how they have the city walls, and then the army comes and surrounds it, right, okay, that's the siege. Now, in in, in the siege, the invading army would surround the city, and the city had its walls, but the purpose of the siege wasn't to just outright overthrow the city, because that would be a lot of casualties and a lot of war. The purpose of the siege was to keep anybody from getting in the city and keeping anybody in the city from getting out, and then it cut off all supplies. It it would cut off the water, it would cut off trade, it would cut off any food. And if there wasn't a water supply already inside the city, that was cut off. So what would happen to the people in the city is they would begin to starve. Now, they'd get so weak, they'd either surrender or they'd be too weak to defend themselves. 
and then the city will be conquered. Now, when we think about these sieges, sieges could last for years. Um, the longest siege in history lasted 26 years. It was in the 1700s. Uh, a Muslim held siege to a city, um, Sarajevo, and it lasted for 26 years. And thousands of people died. The next longest siege happened in April 1992 and went to February 1996. And that was Sarajevo. Um, in that siege, 14,000 people died. I mean, we don't even hear about these things. And this just happened just recently, right? Well, in this particular siege with Samaria, um, things got so bad in Samaria that the people were selling a donkey's head for over three hundred dollars. You know, and I was, I was thinking about that. OK, a donkey's head it has brains, right? And gums and I guess fur and eyeballs. But I don't. can you eat the brains? I don't know. I, I guess you can eat the tongue because, you know, there's beef tongue, whatever, but there's not that much meat on a donkey's head. So they're selling a donkey's head for $300. And then other people were cleaning out their pigeon coops and selling the droppings for $40 a pint. Now, as I understand it, you can cook pigeon poop and eat it and use it for like salt or something. I, I don't know. I, so, things were really bad for the rich people in the city, but they were even worse for the poor people. So, verse 26 says, Then the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, and a woman cried out to him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, if the Lord does not help you, if Yahweh doesn't help you, where can I find help from you for you? From the threshing floor? From the wine press? Then the king said to her, What's troubling you? Okay, so basically the king, he's like, you know, patrolling on the top of the city wall, checking out his troops and his defenses and the state of the city. And this woman, she comes up pleading. For his help and to address the need of her case because in, in those days if you had a, a case you could bring it directly to the king to be heard and basically his answer was lady look if God isn't helping you what am I supposed to do I mean you think I'm gonna make grain magically appear from the from the threshing floor or pull some grapes from thin air from the wine press but I am the king so What's your problem? And she says, this woman, I guess the lady is standing there with her, said to me, give me your son that we may eat him today. And we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give me your son that we may eat him. But now she has hidden her son. Okay, so I guess, you know, the first thought of this is like, that's repulsive, right? But then you, you kind of start thinking, well, at least I start thinking like, were these two kids still alive while they were making these plans? Or maybe one of them was dead or they were, you know, I don't know. But when we take a step back and consider what's going on in Israel at this time, at this time, the northern kingdom of Israel was deep in Baal worship. Remember, Jezebel is still alive. And Asherah, 
Okay, so you guys remember Baal was the god of whatever, and he had a wife named Asherah, right? And in order to bring crops and fertility, they had orgies because that would make Baal have an orgy with Asherah and all this stuff. This was their way of worshiping, right? But then with these babies, they would sacrifice them to the god Molech. So all this is going on in Israel at this time. And then when Jeroham became the king, he went back to golden calf worship. So you got Baal worship, Asherah's worship, the, the, the worship of Molech and the golden calf. In Jeremiah 32, 35, the Lord says, And they built high places of Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire to Molech which I did not command them, nor did it come to my mind that they should do this abomination. So the people were sacrificing their babies, right? Um, today, Molech is just called Planned Parenthood. It's the same thing. You got all of this sex and these unwanted pregnancies, so sacrifice the baby. So at this time, these two children, they had at least survived their parents' Baal worship. But they only survived Baal worship to be eaten. Now the Lord had promised these kind of curses would fall on Israel if they turned from him and started worshiping other gods. In Deuteronomy 28, verse 52. By the way, if you ever want to um, give yourself a God reality check, read Deuteronomy 28. It starts off great. But in Deuteronomy 28, 52, the Lord said, I will bring a nation against you. Until they have destroyed you, they shall besiege you at your gates until your high and fortified walls, which you trust and come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you and all your gates throughout all your land, which the Lord God has given you. You shall eat the fruit of your own body, the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters, whom the Lord your God has given you in the siege in desperate times in which your enemy shall distress you. A sensitive and very refined man, the most tender-hearted man among you, will have no compassion and will be hostile towards his brother and towards his wife and towards the rest of his children whom he leaves behind, so that he will not give them any of the flesh of his children whom he is devouring, because he has nothing left to eat in the siege and is desperate. And the tender and delicate woman, the woman who was so delicate that she would not so much as let her feet touch the ground with her bare foot, will be selfish. And she will be selfish towards her husband and towards her daughter. Her placenta, which comes out from between her feet and her children whom she bears, she will eat them secretly for lack of food in the siege and in desperate straits which your enemies will besiege you at the gates. So, God said, this is what's going to happen to you when you turn from me and start worshiping other gods. When we look at this woman, it says, I mean, think about it. Did she have to go and kill her baby and cook him? Or was he already dead from starvation? But the way it's written, it seems like both of the kids were still alive when their mothers made these plans. Because the second lady, after they ate the first baby, <coughs> hid her son. But check this out. This woman wasn't even concerned with the fact that they had resulted to cannibalizing their own kids. 
she was mad about being unfor unfairly shortchanged in their deal. Her complaint was, it's unfair that she has hidden her son and I won't get to eat him because she's selfish. Look at it. It says, so we boiled my son and ate him. And I said to her on the next day, give me your son that we made him. But she has hidden him. Verse 30 says, now it happened when the king heard the words of the woman that he tore his clothes and passed by on the wall. And the people looked and underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Then he said, God do so to me and more also if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, Remind, remains on him today. Okay, so Elisha had been telling Jeroham for years, listen, you're the king and you're leading the nation into idolatry. The result is going to be chastisement against the nation. But when he refused to repent, Elisha told him, Okay, well, now the Lord has pronounced a famine on the land. But check this out. If that still doesn't get your attention, remember what the Lord said in Leviticus 26. In Leviticus 26, the Lord said, If you do not obey me, I will even appoint terror over you, a wasting disease and a fever which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. I will set my face against you and you shall be defeated by your enemies. And after all this, if you do not obey me, I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break your pride and your power. I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze. For your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees yield their fruit. But if you still continue to walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. And if by these things you are still not reformed by me and continue to walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you and I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will bring the sword against you and I will execute the vengeance of the covenant when you are gathered together when you're in your cities. I will send pestilence among you and I will deliver you into the hand of your enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread and you do not obey me, but continue to walk contrary to me, then I will also walk contrary to you in fury. I will chastise you, chastise you seven times more for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons. You shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places of worship and cut down your altars and your lifeless carcasses shall be thrown in the field and my soul shall abhor you. The God, the, the, the Israel Jews, they knew the word of God. They knew all of this was a result of their disobedience to God. And so Elisha's been telling the king, look, man, this is what's going to happen because of your idol worship. Now, in Samaria, which was the capital city of Israel, in the dead center of the city, the biggest structure was the temple to Baal. Jezebel and all her priests and priestess were still having full run of the nation. And Jeroboam was worshiping the golden calf. But check this out. It seems like he kind of got a little bit of wake up. You know, there's a famine in the land. Now the Syrians are besieging the nation. And it's like, okay, I guess I better give God what he wants. I'm going to put on sackcloth. Now sackcloth is like an outward showing of sorrow and repentance, right? So he's like, okay, I'm, God, I'm going to give you what you want. We're starving. We got the army surrounding us. There's no food. I'll put on some sackcloth. Because he wanted God to see him repenting. But he had it on under his royal robes. He wasn't changing anything. 
in his heart. Mm. But he wanted God to be like, you know, a peace. I'm going to give you what you want so you can stop bothering us, right? Mm. Now, check it out. He didn't turn the ball to bring no food or any rain or weather or any of that. He just, okay, okay, Yahweh is making it tough, so I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put on this sackcloth. Then when the lady tells him, look, we just ate my son, and the lady hid her son, he had a fit and tore his robe so everybody could see that he had sackcloth underneath. It was a false outward repentance, mm. hoping that God would be appeased. And there's a scripture where the Lord says, tear your heart and not your clothes, because I don't care what you do on the outside. So evidently, Elijah had told Jerem, listen, the Lord is going to deliver us from the Syrians and the famine. It's going to end soon. But when this lady had brought the news uh, of them eating their children, the king's first reaction was not, oh, God, I have sinned against you. His reaction was, I'm going to kill the man of God. Because the destruction of the city and all the horrors going on is his fault and the Lord's. But he never took ownership of what he has done as the king. And he's the one that was leading the people into idolatry. And it was because of him God brought chastisement on the land. When we look at the world the world blames the Christians for the consequences brought about for its love of sin. And some sort of twisted way of thinking, because, you know, the world's led by the devil. Um, the world says to themselves, if we get rid of God and we get rid of the Christians, we'll be able to do whatever we want without consequence. The world believes that if there was no God and we were not here representing them, there wouldn't be any problems. I guess the best way to put it is, as a criminal, I could be in a room with a bunch of robbers, a bunch of thieves, a bunch of murderers, and be at total peace. But when the police showed up, it was a problem. It was pandemonium. It was havoc. It was like everything was good till y'all came. That's how the world feels about God. God is the problem. If you listen to the alphabet community, they blame the suicides of their high rate of suicide practicing their lifestyle on Christians. They say if Christians would accept us and wouldn't tell us that we were sinners, we wouldn't commit suicide. They say we hate them because we don't accept their sin. So it's our hateful rejection of their lifestyle which drives them to suicide. People would rather dig their heels in and fight against the Lord till death because they just can't admit my chosen sinful lifestyle and partnership with the devil is what's driving me to kill myself. Right? I was talking to somebody and they were saying, you know, at a time my family was all upset talking about my drinking was the problem. And, they, and, and what they told me, I, I had to laugh. They're like, my, my, my drinking is not the problem. The problem is you having a problem with my drinking. It don't make sense, right? Resistance to the Holy Spirit results in violence. And so when God is trying to reach someone, when he's trying to reach people and they are bent on their sin, the result is violence. If it's not towards others, it's towards self. 
Because when you embrace the devil, he comes to do three things. Steal, kill, and destroy. And that's all that's going to come from it. But instead of saying, it's my choices that have brought me these consequences, the twist comes in, it's your fault that there's these consequences. But the Lord says, just humble yourself and come into agreement with me about your sin so I can begin my work of saving and delivering you. In Jeremiah 3.13, the Lord says, Only acknowledge your iniquity, that you have transgressed against the Lord and have committed adultery against him by worshiping idols under every green tree and have not obeyed my voice, says the Lord. He's like, just admit that you're wrong. That's it. And then I can start working with you. Verse 32. So the king, he's mad. He's going to go cut off Elijah's head because all of this is Elijah's fault. So Elijah's sitting in his house with the elders and they were sitting with him. And the king sent the man ahead of him. But before the messenger came to him, came to him, Elijah said to the elders, do you see how this son of a murderer has sent someone to take away my head? Look, when the messenger comes, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. It's not the sound of his master's feet behind him. And while he was still talking with them, there was the messenger coming down to him. Then the king said, surely this calamity is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? All right, so Elisha is the nation's chief prophet. And the Lord has spoke to him about everything that was going on and everything that was going to happen. Now, Elisha had multiple safe places to stay all over the nation. But staying somewhere outside of the city of Samaria is not what he did. Instead, he was in his house in Samaria, suffering through the famine right alongside the rest of the people. See, God didn't call him to a life of comfort. He called him to a life of faith, constantly being strengthened through blessing and suffering. Elisha was hungry just like everyone else. See, many Christians believe that they should never be made to be uncomfortable. They feel that whenever any discomfort or affliction comes into their lives, it's a spiritual attack against them by the devil or human haters. But the truth is, often and most times, it's the Lord who's bringing affliction into our lives. And he does it for purification, for strength, and to grow our faith in him. See, sometimes it could be a chastisement as a result for sin or affliction could be for doing exactly what the Lord wants and you're dead sinner in his will, but he's pruning you to bring forth more fruit. So when discomfort comes into my life, instead of me saying, yes, Lord, what are you teaching me? What are, me, what are you showing me? I want to rebuke the devil. <laughs> So Elisha was sitting in his house, fellowshipping with the wise leaders of the city, and they were seeking the Lord. And, and then the Lord tells Elisha, the king's ex executioner is on his way, but the king is right behind him to make sure the job is done. So Elisha says, hey, when this son of a murderer gets here, shut the door and keep him out. Now, he called him a son of a murderer. You got to remember who Gerald Jerohim's parents were Jezebel and Ahab but in this case Elisha was talking about Ahab since Jerohim had chose to walk in the steps of his father and want to murder a godly man because things weren't going his way remember when Ahab wanted this field and the godly man was like, I can't give you that field. It's my family's inheritance. Ahab was like, 
<laughs> and then Jezebel arranged for him to get killed. So when the messenger got there, they shut the door. And while he's standing there beating on the door, Jerohim comes up whining like a spoiled brat, like his daddy Ahab. And he's like, I've been waiting for God to do something. I even put on sackcloth. See, I'm repenting. But the Lord hasn't delivered us from the Syrians or the famine. And it's all God's fault that people are eating each other. Why should I believe you and wait any longer for God? Chapter seven. Actually, it shouldn't be a chapter here, but that's how it's set up. See, when the Bible was written, it wasn't written with chapters and verses. It was just written on 30 foot long scrolls, right? Somewhere through history, somebody came up with verses and chapters, which makes it easier for us. Because unless you knew your Bible by heart, you wouldn't know where to go, right? So verse, verse 1, chapter 7. Then Elijah answers the king and says, Hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, tomorrow about this time, a shea of flying, fine flour shall be sold for a shekel, and two seas of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Then an officer on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Look, if the Lord to make windows in heaven, could this thing be? And Elisha said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. Okay, Elisha said, Listen, king, check this out. Today you guys are paying over $300 for a donkey's head and $40 for a pint of uh, dove doo-doo. But in 24 hours, eight gallons of high quality flour will be sold for 50 cents and 16 gallons of barley for 50 cents. I guess, you know, I was trying to think, well, how would that compare today? I guess it would be like somebody saying tomorrow gas is dropping to five cents a gallon. <laughs> Well, you guys remember Naaman. Um, not Naaman. I'm sorry. So, King Jeroham's right-hand man. He's a new right-hand man. He, he, he started mocking Elijah, being sarcastic about God's power, saying... Look, even if Yahweh was real and he had power, what's he going to do? Rain food down from heaven? I mean, what do you think this is? Cloudy with a chance of meatballs? <laughs> so God pronounced judgment on him for his unbelief. The Lord said, just so that you know the Lord is real and has all power, you're going to see all this food. But you're going to die without ever tasting a single bite. Now, God's judgment wasn't on him because he had doubts or because he couldn't comprehend how the Lord could make such a thing happen unless he opened the heavens and made red, um, bread rain down from heaven. The reason why is because this man's heart utterly despised the Lord and the thought of God being real just it basically sickened him and in his mind even if god was real the only impossible option god had would be to make bread rain from heaven now remember this guy is a jew he absolutely knew that god could make bread fall from heaven and feed his people this dude was alive when Elijah called fire down from heaven on different occasions. He saw Naaman being healed from his leprosy. He was there in the city when the Syrian army marched in blind. But he simply hated the Lord. 
He hated the idea of submitting to him. He hated the idea that the Lord had real power over the gods that he worshipped. And so, being a smart mouth, he gave the Lord one option. To bring food through raining it down from heaven. And even in that, he didn't believe God could do it. In Jeremiah 7, 24, it says, Yet they did not obey or incline their ear, but followed the counsels and dictates of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. God says, even though I gave you my word, you didn't listen. You went backward and chose to believe the lies of your own heart. He said, I sent to you my servants, the prophets, early rising up, but you didn't obey me or inclined your ear, but were just hard-headed and did worse than your ancestors. When it comes to our unbelief, our unbelief brings us to a point where we can only see God working things out one of two ways. And then we have doubts that God would even do that. But we got to remember the Lord's, are not, the Lord's ways are not our ways. And he's infinitely bigger than our unbelief or the mental box that we try to contain him in. See, we get things twisted and turned around. It's the Lord that gives us Two options, either to believe him or not. But since man wants to be God, we try to turn that around and say to God, here's your two options. Now choose wisely. I mean, how many times you know had a problem? You're like, God, there's only one way out of this. Right. And God is like, yeah, no, that that option never even occurred to me. I have an option that you are not even aware of. So verse 3. The scene changes. Now we're outside of the city. Now there were four lepers, four leprous men at the entrance of the gate. And they said to one another, why are we sitting here until we die? If we say we'll enter the city, the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit here, we die also. Now, therefore, come, let us surrender to the army of the Syrians. If they keep us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall only die. And they arose at twilight to go to the camp of the Syrians. And when he had come to the outskirts of the Syrian camp, to their surprise, no one was there. For the Lord had caused the army of the Syrians to hear the noise of chariots and the noise of horses and the noise of a great army. So the Syrians said to one another, look, the king of Israel has hired, a, hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to attack us. Therefore, they arose and fled at twilight and left the camp intact, their tents, their horses and their donkeys, and they fled for their lives. OK, so. You guys, you guys remember that the Jews had different laws concerning people with leprosy than every other nation in the world. In Israel, lepers had to stay outside of the city. And when they were coming down the road or wherever, they had to announce their presence by, you know, saying unclean, unclean. Well, the way that lepers ate was by staying outside the city walls where the people dumped all their garbage and food over the wall. But in these four lepers' case, nobody was dumping food over the wall because everybody inside the city was starving. So one of them was like, look, we can stay here and die. We can go into the city and die. Or we can take our chances with the Syrian army for some food. If they feed us, great. If they kill us, at least we die trying. So as the sun was going down, you got to get the picture. 
they walked in the way where they didn't go directly to the Syrian army camp. They went around it and came up from the rear of the Syrian camp where it was furthest from the city. And, and by coming that way, it didn't look they were it didn't look like they were people from the city. It looked like they were from somewhere else. So they had a greater chance of mercy. Is that making sense? Yes, no, kind of. OK. So when they get there, nobody's there. Now. Check this out. It says the Lord caused the Syrian army to hear the noise of a great army of horses and chariots. And the Syrians were terrified that they were hearing two armies from two superpowers, um, the Hittites in the north and the Egyptians in the south. So basically, they thought two armies were closing in army, closing in army on them. And they took off east back towards Syria. Right. Proverbs 28, 1 says, The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are bold as a lion. Okay. Sometimes when I, when I relapse, that verse would be in my head because I'd be trying to get away, and there was nobody there. It was like the wicked are fleeing when nobody is pursuing. <laughs> Paranoia. <laughs> Paranoia. Well, now let's go back a couple weeks. Remember when Elisha was asleep and, and, and the king of Syria sent the, his army to go, to go kidnap him? And Elisha's servant was like, oh, no, what are we going to do? And Elisha prayed that his eyes would be open. And he saw all around him chariots of fire and horses. I believe... God opened the ears of the Syrian army to hear his angelic army. And the sounds of that heavenly army scared them so bad, nothing they had on earth mattered except fleeing for their lives. Verse 8 says, <clears throat> And when the lepers came into the outskirts of the camp, and they went into a tent and ate and drank and carried, carried from it silver and gold and clothing and went and hid them. Then they came and entered another tent, tent and carried some, some uh, stuff from there also, and they went and hid it. Okay, so they went to the first tent. I don't know. They probably crept in, noticed nobody was there, and tables all set. And they sit down and had a feast, and then they looted it. I mean, you know. And then they, you know, like, well, we should hide some of these valuables for later. Because, you know, there's still a famine in the city. And then after that, they went back and burglarized another tent. And in verse 9 says, and then they said to one another, we are not doing right. This day is a day of good news, and we remain silent. If we wait until morning light, some punishment will come upon us. Now, therefore, let us go and tell the king's household. So they went and called to the gatekeepers of the city and told them, saying, We went to the Syrian camp, and surprisingly, no one was there, not a human sound, only horses and donkeys tied and the tents intact. Then the gatekeepers called out and they told it to the king's household inside. Okay, so check this out. They got all this food. They got all this all this um, loot and everything. And then it suddenly dawns on them like, we're wrong for not sharing this life-saving good news of what we have found in the Syrian camp to everyone that we know who is starving inside the city. Now, the only difference between these starving lepers who were outside of the city and the people who was inside the city was that for the lepers, their situation brought them to the end of themselves. So they took a step of faith towards who they thought was their enemy in order to save their lives. When they got to the Syrian camp, 
they found that the Lord had removed all their fears and had prepared a banquet for them. Mm. And at first, they selfishly thought about keeping this secret to themselves and hoard it away. But it dawned on them they needed to share this life-saving good news with everyone. So they went back and shared what they had found to the guards on the wall. For all of us who know Jesus, we are those lepers. We found the soul-saving good news in Jesus, the one who we once thought was our enemy. Now think about this. Jesus didn't save you for yourself. He saved you. He saved me. And he gave us a command to go into the world and share the good news of Christ. A lot of Christians get saved and they say things like, well, my relationship with God is my own. You know, and and, and I don't need to go to church because I don't need church to have God, which is true. But God didn't save you to be a hermit. He saved you to share what he's given you with others and to receive what he has given others with you. I mean, when you party with the devil, you had no problem sharing what you had, right? It could be four o'clock in the morning on a rainy night. And if you had a sack of something, you went to somebody's house and knocked on the door. Right? But I don't want to share Jesus. Remember in the parable of the talents, two of the good servants uh, multiplied their master's talent. But the wicked servant told his master in Matthew 25, 24, I know you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. And look, here you have what belongs to you. But his Lord answered him and said, you wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown, gather where I have scattered. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would receive back my own with interest. Then he said, take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents and cast this unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of the teeth. Basically, the Lord is saying, look, if you've been saved and you know me, but you bury that, That's wicked. Verse 13. Or verse 12, I'm sorry. So the king, when he got this news, he arose at night and said to his servants, all right, let me tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we're hungry. And so they've gone and hid themselves in the field saying, when the people come out of the city, we'll, show, we'll catch them alive and get into the city. Then one of his servants answered and said, please, let several men take five of the remaining horses which are left in the city. Look, they may either become all like the multitude of Israel that are left in it. Or indeed, I say, they may become like all the multitude of Israel left from those who are consumed. So let us send them and see. Therefore, they took two chariots with horses and the king sent them in the direction of the Syrian army saying, go and see. And they went after them to the Jordan. And indeed, the road was full of garments and weapons, which the Syrians had thrown away in their haste. So the messengers returned and told the king. Then the people went out and plundered the tents of the Syrians. So a shea of flying flour was sold for a shekel and two seas of barley for a shekel, according to the word of the Lord. Okay, so the king, he thought this is a trap. And his servants basically said, look, dude, what do we got to lose? Let us go check and see. 
Now, they wanted to go ride on five horses, but the king gave them two. And so when they got there, they got to the camp and they found for 25 miles along the road going all the way back to the Jordan, there was a trail, trail of stuff that the Syrians left running back towards the Jordan River. I mean, they were so scared that they took off anything they thought would slow them down. Okay. Now, just think about this. You got to be super scared to leave your horse behind because you think you can run faster. <laughs> I mean, seriously. Here's a getaway horse. Here's my feet. <laughs> and while they were running, they were stripping. They were dropping their swords, their everything, taking out anything that's going to slow me down because I'm trying to get up out of here. They already told us that this place was was crazy. And then the king keeps and, and check this out. The king was with him because he got so mad. He went himself to besiege the city. Now that's going to play in, a, in, a, in, in the next chapter. But God had been trying to reach him all along. The king of Syria, right? He sent back his, his number one general, cleaned and saved. He brought back his smaller army that was blind and fat and full. And they said, we ain't going back no more. So this time he went himself. Now he done heard God's angelic army and took off running, left everything. Fire still cooking, animals. Left all the all their jewelry and my, they gone. Ran back home, butt naked. <laughs> I mean, just kind of get the picture. You gotta, you gotta really understand what's happening here. Now, the king of Israel appointed the officer on whose hand he leaned. To give charge of the gate. Okay, remember the dude that got smart with Elijah, right? Mm -hmm. But the people trampled him in the gate and he died, just as the man of God said, who had spoke to him, spoke when the king came down to him. So it happened just as the man of God spoke to the king, saying, Two shears of barley for a shekel and a shear of flour for a shekel shall be sold tomorrow at this time in the gate of Samaria. Then that officer answered the man of God and said, Look now, the Lord will make if the Lord will make windows in heaven, could such a thing be? And Elijah said, In fact, you shall see it with your eyes, but you shall not eat of it. So it happened to him, for the people trampled him in the gate, and he died. Okay. So this dude that mocked God and Elijah, he was given the job to oversee the people. Now, in Daryl's mind, I imagine him standing in the gate, feeling important, telling everybody, all right, people, get in single file line, wait for me to call your number, and I'll let you know when it's your turn to exit to go get some food. And the people were like, dude, shut up. We're starving, and we ain't got time for you to feel important and just ran him over. I mean, seriously. You got a whole city of people. They starving. Yeah. And you want to be important. All right, now I'm going to assign you your... <laughs> and so the word of the Lord was proven true. Mm -hmm. Mr. Important saw the food, but he never got to share in the blessing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in Lamentations 3, it says, This I call to mind, therefore I have hope. Through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. For he does not enjoy bringing affliction nor grief to the children of men. Mm. When God puts us in these places of affliction, it's not because he enjoys torturing you or making your life miserable. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. He's doing it to a place where you can receive and appreciate his mercy. And so next time you're in a place of affliction, instead of running around rebuking the devil, ask the Lord, God, what are you showing me? And thank you for your mercy so that I can draw closer. See, for God, sometimes, if not most of the time, it's necessary to humble us in order to bring us to him. You know, people say, God would never let more on me than, than I can handle. Okay, well, that's absolutely not the truth. God will allow more than you can handle so that you can say uncle and look up. Because if you can handle it, what do I need you for? Really? So he does allow more on us than we can handle so that we know that we can't handle it. His affliction is for the purifying of our faith so that we can know that the Lord has more resources than simply opening the windows of heaven. Mm. Amen. Oh, Lord, we thank you so much that your mercies are new every day and that you have more than opening the windows of heaven to rain down bread. You can bring an enemy to provide all of our provisions and remove them at your word. So, Father, help us to trust you, to believe you, to humble ourselves so that you don't have to humble us. And in those times of testing and refining, help us to remember that these things are needed because you say so to draw us closer to you. We thank you, Jesus, for your grace, for your blessings and your favor. In Jesus' name, amen.